and welcome to the first part of a wrap-up of everything I've read so far this year! Except for Percy Jackson, which I've already posted a reading vlog of me reading the series for the first time. So if you're interested in my thoughts on that, I'll link the video above and below. Not to start off with bad vibes, but I did happen to begin the year with two DNFs. The first was The Ship of Magic by Robin Hobb. I had only ever heard great things about this trilogy as a great way to get into a fantasy series. I am no stranger to fantasy, you know, suspending disbelief, getting into the world building an author has created. You know what I'm saying? I was ready. I was like, Robin, take me away. I got about 50 pages into this book and the world building just didn't make any sense to me. At first I was like, all right, we've got a pirate moment on this like magical beach. Okay, I can work with that. And all of a sudden she would just throw in like giant talking crabs or something that just didn't mesh for some reason. And it was like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? The second one I DNF'd was Close Range Wyoming Stories by Annie Prue. Prue. I did French immersion. Brokeback Mountain, the movie, was a huge part of my youth. It was very important to me. It was the first movie I watched and felt like I had been on a truly emotional journey with. When it ended, I felt that I had also aged 20 years. It was filmed in Alberta. I used to live in Alberta and I went back there for grad school. So I thought, why not get the collection that has the short story that the movie's based on in it and so I can try more of her writing. I'm gonna start with the things that I did like. The stories in this book do speak to a very specific physical and social landscape of Wyoming in the 60s to the 80s. It's also written in the accent. So there's that extra layer of feeling really immersed. I really enjoyed the first couple of stories one was about an older gentleman who takes like a little bit of a road trip. One was like a little bit spooky. So I was like, okay. Oh, okay. But after that, every other single story was written from the perspective of a young guy. All the women in the story were either their m shitty moms that they hated or women they wanted to fuck or both in the case of one stepmom and every story, again, from their perspective, featured them sexually assaulting or raping women. And although incredibly accurate, I was like, literally, how dare you make me read this and only this. But we turn it around with Death Threat by Vivek Shreya and Ness Lee. This is the graphic novelization of Vivek receiving a series of death threats that are rooted very specifically in like hatred towards trans feminine people. And it goes through the process of her receiving these threats, deciding to turn them into art, while also discussing the experiences and structures that contribute to receiving hate online as a femme person. It's really beautifully illustrated and I think it's a really interesting way to talk about these issues. And I mean, we just, this is a Vivek Shreya fan channel. I also read River Woman by Katerina Vermette, which is a poetry collection. As you may have guessed, the river is very central to this collection where it's discussed both conceptually as well as the reality and how it exists both in tandem to and in resistance to the city as well as the land. It talks about love as a decolonial act as well as the decolonial as a part of everyday practice. It's a really wonderful collection and I'm so glad that I was able to read and share her work in this way because I do have her other novel, The Break, but I'm still just, I'm still not ready for it. Friends, we are now at my favorite book of the year, okay? <laughs> the competition's closed and also one of the best books I've ever read. And hi, hello, it's Homegoing by Yagiyasi. I know that people have been talking about this book for a long time. You've probably heard it, but in case you haven't, it's about two sisters, Effia and Essie, in modern day Ghana. One of them is sold into slavery and ends up in America, and the other marries the British governor. Each chapter alternates between their descendants, and you're able to kind of largely track very significant events that happen in terms of slavery to the end of slavery, how it morphs into similar structures, as well as resistance movements. And it is done so exquisitely my god even though you only get like a chapter per person it is done so well that you still felt or I still felt so connected and invested in each person and what was happening around them sometimes you also get to hear about each character from their children so you have a sense of closure with a lot of the characters in that way if you just don't really like historical fiction, it's not your thing, then maybe you wouldn't like it as much. But if you have at any point been interested in reading this book, I highly, highly recommend it. Okay, 
you just need to do it. Then I read Dread Nation by Justina Ireland, which I actually read for a class on American politics and fiction that I took last semester. This book presents an alternative history, an alternative timeline, wherein the zombie virus happens in the middle of the Civil War. In response to this event, one of the things that happens is that the government sets up these combat schools and they forcibly take black children, in this case following black girls in particular, and place them in schools throughout the country where they are taught to fight the zombies in order to protect white people. And this system is justified through a lot of the same biological racism that has justified colonialism, slavery, and still comes up a lot in healthcare. In terms of what I liked about the book, I really liked Jane. I think she was a really great narrator. I also really liked that Jane was allowed to just have a sexuality in a way that wasn't like a huge moral issue and battle that she had to have or something really tragic didn't happen. There was also really nuanced discussions of like race and racial hierarchy in this book. For instance, the politics of white passing is a huge part of the story as well as the situation with the working white class men in the story who are called drovers and how they were resentful and racist towards the black population because they felt like they were given this special treatment by the government because they were being like sent to schools and trained even though it's happening under this huge amount of biological racism and it's hugely exploitative. However, my biggest issue with this book is that nuance did not carry over to the representation of indigenous peoples. At first we see Jane reading these stories in the newspaper that are these like western frontier stories and these stories were a huge part of the mythology of the frontier and justifications for Western expansion. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. This is going to be where Jane starts off. And then at some point in the book, she's going to be challenged. And then there's going to be more discussion about the way that white supremacy and colonialism is affecting Black people and Indigenous people. And that seems like that was the intention in the book, uh, but it's not at all what happened. At the end of the book, it's revealed that Justina Ireland based the combat schools on what is called like missionary or boarding schools, which my understanding is the equivalent to residential schools. There is a lot of information about residential schools, especially in Canada, that has come out in the last several years. So there's a lot of really easily accessible information if you want to learn more about them. But basically these were schools that were set up by the government with missionaries and churches in order to civilize Indigenous peoples. This was a systemic moment of cultural genocide in order to eradicate the indigenous population. It was just equated to the combat schools in a way that just wasn't accurate, didn't really make sense. There was lots of other things in this story too, like the way that Custer at one point was basically described as having died at the hands of his own men, which completely erases the fact that he died during a really significant battle between the Lakota and Cheyenne people. And if you're trying to include indigenous people, in a narrative of alternative history, like why would you erase something like that? I'm gonna leave a, a link to a blog post down below that more succinctly breaks down all of the issues throughout the book and why they're issues. And then we have Sour Heart by Jenny Zhang, which is a collection of short stories about girls from Chinese immigrant families to America that are all loosely connected. When I realized that this was published by Lenny Press, which is Lena Dunham's imprint, I was like, oh, that makes sense because this is the kind of book that Lena Dunham wishes she could write and that it is visceral and gross and uncomfortable, but in a literary way. The voice in Jenny Zing's writing is really, really incredible. Like it was so, so well written. There were three stories that I did have to just like completely skip because they had very graphic depictions of children sexually assaulting each other or just other really uncomfortable weirdness happening in that area. But even though I had to just like straight up skip those, I'm still really, really glad that I read this book. And if that's something that you also can't read, I will list the stories down below to avoid because I still think it's worth it. And then we have the subtweet by Vivek Shreya. Like I said, we stand Vivek in this house. This is her newest release that came out earlier this year. And I just love this little book so much. It is about Neela, who is a indie musician doing her own thing. And Rukmini, who is a cover artist, 
who covers one of Neela's songs. It goes viral and then they end up becoming friends. It's about how this friendship undergoes the pressure, in this case in the music industry, that pits women of color against each other and creates all this like jealousy and tension and eventually their friendship and careers kind of implode over this subtweet. There's also no romantic relationships in this book. It is just about women being friends with each other. Something that Vivek talked about when she did a virtual book launch and one of her stomps was on the Glass Bookshop IG Live, which first of all, this is what she was wearing. Oh my God, do you see this? Look at this. Literally, how dare you? One of the things she talked about was how hard it is to write a book about people being on the internet. <laughs> and making that compelling but she really does like the book is so tense like she really captures you know the tension of crafting texts and tweets and posts and not getting responses back the book it's stressful to read it stressed me out someone also asked her a question about what it was like to write the white characters in the book because even though the book centers around the friendship circles of these brown women there is some periphery kind of famous white musicians and so one of the things that Vivek said is that she really wanted to write white people in the moment that they are now in terms of having seen the woke moment and know all the right things to say but like still just fucking it up <laughs> and completely misunderstanding and misusing all this terminology and these concepts. She also okay li listen 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 listen. Vivek is not only an author amongst many things, she's also a musician. And so she has actually written an album for this book of the music that's discussed in the book. You have access to it when you purchase this book, which you definitely should. Okay, but can you just imagine being that talented? Thus concludes part one of this wrap up. I will see you in part two. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.